Well, good morning again. Glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. Did everybody get their picture made? Woohoo! All right. If you see any slackers, you know, let me know. If you are our guest this morning, we're really especially glad that you are here with us this morning. I uh, hope you feel the love of Christ through his people. I hope you feel the Holy Spirit in this place. Uh, if you are our guest, there's a card in the seat pocket in front of you with a blue stripe on the top that says guests. We would love for you to fill that out. You don't have to do that, but would love to know you were here. And at the end of the service, you can bring that card. I'll be out in the foyer uh, out here. I've got a free gift for our guests. Or you can just leave it in the seat there if you'd rather not meet me, Robert. No, I uh, would love to meet you and get to know you. I failed to mention earlier, but our youth picked up the slack. That, uh, I was covering Billy's stuff today, so I'm sorry. I was kind of out of, out of sync there, but our registration slips should be going around. You can also register through our app. How many of you have the Wiley Memphis app? Yeah, it's free. Go to the, go to the app store and look for Wiley Memphis. Download that. It's, it keeps you updated on everything that's going on. Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2 is where we are today. Now, uh, in, in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, I don't preach a lot out of Revelation because some of it, I, did, I just, quite honestly, I'm not, I don't feel uh, qualified to teach out of Revelation all the time. I'm just being honest with you. Uh, I've studied Revelation, but I still, there's so many different varying theories about certain things and all, but, but chapter 2 and 3 is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Jesus is, has given this vision uh, to John as he's, as he's writing this down, of, and he has something to tell these seven churches in chapter 2 and 3. He has something unique to each one of those churches. And so uh, we pick it up in Revelation 2, uh, verse 1. To the church in Ephesus, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. And I, about this time, the church, the people at the church in Ephesus are puffing out their chest, thinking, we got it going on. Verse 4, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit. We ask you now to send your Holy Spirit upon us to speak through your Holy Spirit in this place with power and authority and transform our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Jimmy Evans, is a, he's a pastor, and he's a, he's, uh, has a, he and his wife Karen have a marriage ministry called Marriage on the Rock. Many of you have probably, Cheryl and I have taught some of that. It's been a few years ago uh, that we've done that, but uh, this guy, I really respect Jimmy Evans. He's He's got uh, a lot of wisdom, but he tells this story about he. It's so it's so funny. Uh, Jimmy and his wife Karen, their story so reflects uh, very similarly to Cheryl and I. But they were they were young. He started dating Karen when he was 16, and I believe she was 15. And uh, he talks about how he his car. And, and Pete, y'all remember your first car? Mine was a green, lime green Pinto, okay? Amen. Mom, I still hadn't forgiven you for that. I'm just saying. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a Christian now. I'm going to be working on it. You know, uh, he, he, he had inherited his mom, after his mom wrecked the, her 68, I'm sorry, 64 Dynamic 88 Oldsmobile. That's a long name for a car. 
64 dynamic 88 Oldsmobile. And his mom wrecked it. It was her car. And she wrecked all down the, the right-hand side, the passenger side of the car. He's just <laughs> all down the side. And said, when she wrecked it, she's like, here, son, you, I got, we got a car for you <laughs> right here. And so he talks about how when he would go to, to pick up Karen for a date, he would make the block, and he would always pull up with a good side show into the house. <laughs> and he said, it was six months after we'd been dating before I even let her see the other side of the car. <laughs> Don't we do that? We want, to, we want to put our best side forward. And, and um, it works not only that way in relationships with people, with our loved ones, but it also works that way in our relationship with the Lord. It, it, when we fall in love because we passionately are pursuing the other person, there's a, there's a pursuit, there's an intentionality. That's how we fall in love. We fall out of love when we begin to take that for granted, take the other person for granted. And as I mentioned this last week, so I'm going to continue the sermon series we started last week, How to Recognize Spiritual Growth in You. Um, how do we know if we're growing? Because you're never, you're never in the same place. I promise you, tomorrow you're going to either be closer to the Lord or further away from Him. It, it, we don't ever remain stagnant. We're constantly moving. It's the same way with relationships with people. Either we're we're nurturing those relationships and we're growing closer or we're growing farther apart. I see it all the time in, in marriage ministry as I talk to folks um, that when have been married a few years and, and suddenly uh, I, one of them will say to, to me as I visit with them and counseling with them, they'll say, I just don't love him anymore. Well, what's happened or just don't love her anymore. What's happened is the, the passionate pursuit to win the heart of the other has subsided. It's, it's suffered. The relationship suffers. How do we recognize spiritual growth in you? Last week we talked about that the, the message of the cross still stirs us. Church, does, it, does the message of the cross still stir you? I mean, do you get emotional when you... No, I'm not talking about every second of every day, but I mean, when you really reflect upon the cross, does it stir you? Does it, does it move you? What he did for us? And this week... We recognize spiritual growth when we cling to our first love. We cling to our first love. Um, so I'm going to jump right into this passage. There's a lot to, to unpack here in this, in this uh, message to the church in Ephesus. I don't think it's just a message to the church in Ephesus. I think it's a message to us. The first is, Christ is pleased with our good deeds. It pleases him when we serve him and when we serve others. It pleases him. He, 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 this is, these are the words of Christ. They're, they're in red for a reason. I know your deeds, he says, Jesus says, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. I know that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered. You have endured hardships for my name and you have not grown weary. And I think... It's like he's patting them on the back and saying, you, that's good. It's good. It pleases God when we do that. But the, here's, the, here's the problem. When we begin to think that good deeds is what it's all about. Now that's, that's, when, we, when we serve others, when we love others, that's the fruit of the relationship with Jesus. It's not how we get the relationship with Jesus. It's the fruit of that. Christ is indeed pleased with our good deeds. But, secondly, good deeds never trump devotion to Jesus. And so so he's, he's, just, he's just gone on and on about all these wonderful things they are doing, how they are serving. But then he says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. It's as if he's saying that, um, yeah, you're doing all these great things, but why are you doing them? Why are you doing them? You're, perhaps your love for me, Jesus may be saying, here is 
perhaps your love for me has waned and you've, you've lost focus and you've been all about this good stuff that you are doing. Um, I've, I've shared this before out of uh, the resurrection picture out of John 21 where Jesus is, uh, he's gone to the cross, he's, he's been resurrected and he's, he's having breakfast with the disciples and I, it's, and I love this story because Peter, we know Peter had denied that he even knew Jesus three times and Jesus had predicted that. And I've said this before, but I can just imagine when Peter heard that Jesus had risen from the grave, I think the first there was this, wow, he did it. And then it was probably like, oh man, <laughs> what have I done? I'm fixing to get scolded. And yet he greets Peter and the other disciples who had deserted him. He greets them with, with peace be with you. And, and so he's, he's, he's sitting with these disciples and he's having breakfast on the shore. And, and they're just sitting around and he asks Peter three times, uh, ironically, since he denied him three times, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Now, he, and I've said this before, but I think it's, it's important for us to hear. He doesn't say, do you love my sheep? Now, we should love Jesus' sheep because we're one of them. But, but he's saying, he, he's got the priority right. Do you love me? That's, the, that's the, the relationship that has to be nurtured and that has to be protected. There has to be intentionality in that relationship. And then the loving of the sheep comes naturally from that. But too many times, even in the church, we flip that and we think the Christian journey is about feeding the sheep. It's the fruit, not first. Jesus says to this church in Ephesus, perhaps to us, yeah, you're doing all this wonderful stuff and I'm pleased with that, but you've forgotten me. You've forgotten why you're doing it. This quote I ran across this week, and we've talked about this before, but I like the way this is kind of summarized in a quote. It says, lukewarm Christians, we talked about being lukewarm two or three weeks ago, Lukewarm Christians are a bad advertisement for a great God. Don't you like that? I like, it just kind of succinctly says it. Lukewarm Christians are a bad advertisement for a great God. Good deeds never trump devotion to Jesus. In fact, good deeds should be the fruit of devotion to Jesus. Um, when... Um, Cheryl and I, I've told you a little bit about Jimmy Evans' dating experience. Cheryl and I, we were, uh, we were young, high school, sweethearts as well. Um, I was sweeter maybe perhaps than she was. I'm not sure. You know, well, I got some groans out of that one, didn't I? Uh, no, she was, she was sweet. Uh, and I was 17, she was 15, and I remember, <laughs> anybody remember the old Westwood Theater? All right, it was 1977, I believe, I recall, and the first run of the very first movie of Star Wars was showing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, that played once upon a time for a first run. So, so Cheryl and I, we were, we were in youth group together, and we did, it wasn't official that we were a thing, but I think we both kind of knew that, that maybe we would like to be. And uh, so I called her one day, and we, we had other friends in youth, and she's like, hey, let's get, let's get everybody from the youth group. Let's, let's go, let's go in, uh, to the movie Star Wars. And we both agreed, okay, you ask the girls, and I'll ask the guys, and we'll all go to Star Wars. I didn't call soap. <laughs> yeah, I may not be as stupid as I look, huh? <laughs> Well, I come to find out later, I called Cheryl and I said, bad, bad break, nobody can go. <laughs> yes, I did lie. That's, I know that's a sin. And, and Cheryl, she was naughty too. She didn't call any of the girls. <laughs> and she said, oh, it's amazing, none of the girls can go either. <laughs> so being the, the kind-hearted man that I am, I said, well, would you like to still go? Me and you can just go. 
I, I was 17. Give me a break, man. Don't judge me. <laughs> so that was kind of sort of our first date. <laughs> and now Westwood Theater, a friend of mine, has a church that they've just remodeled Westwood Theater. It's now a church. And I told him that story. He got a big kick out of that. But we, there, was, there was a pursuit. I, I, there was an intentionality. Um, I was pursuing what turned out to be my first love. I was pursuing her. And, and the, as you now, Cheryl and I just celebrated 39 years of marriage in July. And uh, it's, yes, it's 39 years. She's put up with me. And you, there has to be, you have to guard against taking one another for granted. And, and so there has to be this continual intentionality and pursuit of that relationship. It works the same with Jesus. If we think that if we're counting on um, how things used to be with Jesus five years ago, ten years ago, 20, like, oh, man, well, I remember when I went to camp when I was a kid and I was really, and I surrendered to the Lord and uh, all these, it's like, oh, when was that? Oh, that was in 1974. What, how is it today? How's your relationship today? Thirdly, not only does good deeds never trump devotion to Jesus, but always we must always remember with thankfulness what Christ has done for us. We must always remember with thankfulness what Christ has done for us. And he, he says it in verse 5. He says, remember the, the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. So there's this, um, there's this remembering uh, I, you know, I've told this story before, but I'll just give you a, a snapshot again that for me, um, up until I was 31 years old, having been in church all my life, I thought that the Christian life was about me being good, being a good person. And I, I, first of all, I, I failed at that because none of us can be good enough to be at God's standard. And it, it wasn't until I was 31 years old that I came to realize that, no, it's not about me being good. It's about that he's good and that how he loves me. And, uh, and there was, a, there was this, um, this moment of repentance for uh, the sin in my life and knowing that I couldn't measure up to God's holiness. And then the, through faith, by grace, through faith, coming into relationship with him and then from that point forward, uh, remembering that, the, remembering what he's done for you, and now there's this pursuit of being worthy of being his son and his daughter. Our love for Jesus and our knowledge of his love for us should fuel everything we do, church, should fuel everything we do. I, uh, many of you have heard this quote before from John Wesley, but I actually, I, John Wesley, the founder of, of our faith, the founder of the Methodist Church, um, and just I, I love the thing I love most about John Wesley's story is he spent he was in his mid thirties, had been he was a devout uh, servant, a Christian servant, uh, was a pastor and do, had but was failing miserably. Miserably, he was uh, in the Word and praying, you know, hours upon hours every day. And he was, he was failing. He wasn't even assured of his own salvation. And we know that, that uh, he journaled uh, one night that he, he went very, here we go, he went very reluctantly to a, to a Bible study. Don't you love that? Anybody ever, I know you would never reluctantly come to church here, right? Because you're always so eager to hear the sermon. But, but Wesley, he went very reluctantly. And, and then it says that he in the midst of, of studying God's word out of Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed. And that was the, I believe, and he believed that it was the infilling of the spirit and his ministry at that point exploded. First of all, he, he was at that point for the very first time in his life, he was assured of his own salvation. Can you believe that? He's a preacher, a dedicated servant to people, and he had no idea if he was saved. So he was assured of his own salvation. His ministry exploded. And out of that came the Methodist church. And here's what he said later in his life. 
as he's talking about Methodists. He says this, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America. So he's saying, hey, if Methodist goes away, it's not about Methodists. Anybody know that? Do we know that? It's not about Methodists. It's about Jesus. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. I'm not afraid, he says, that the Methodists should ever cease to exist or exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid that they should only exist as a dead sect having the form of religion without the power. And this undoubtedly will be the case unless they hold fast both the doctrine, the spirit, and the discipline with which they first set out. And so if you read more about Wesley, you, you, he says he was a man of one book. And he's referring to this right here. I mean, and he was very well read. He, he read lots of books, wrote lots of books. But when it came right down to it, he said, I'm a man of one book, God's word, holding fast to that, to that doctrine. And he was also, his message was very consistent uh, that we are saved by grace through faith, that that is preceded by repentance. We must understand what Christ has done for us. And then it's followed by this pursuit of holiness. That there's, it, it's not, I tell people all the time when they come to me and say, hey, I, I want to accept Christ, I want to be baptized. I explain to them, this isn't the finish line. <laughs> it's the starting gate for a life of pursuit of holiness. That is our endeavor. So, what I feel like Jesus is t trying to teach us is you got to cling to your first love. You got to, I'm, the relationship with me is paramount to everything else. It has to come first. And then all the rest of that's fruit. So, how do we do that? And this, I'm just, one scripture is going to communicate, I think, how we do that. It, and it's, it's very simple, but it takes intentionality. It comes out of Colossians chapter 3. I think it's in your handout. Since then you have been raised with Christ. So he's, Paul is talking to Christians. Since you've been raised with Christ, you've experienced, you've encountered salvation. Then he says, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So what he's talking about, that our hearts and our minds should be focused on Jesus. We should, and, and there's so many things in this world that distract us from that. Is, isn't there, church? There's so many, and I'm, man, I, I'm at the front of the line. We get distracted by so many things that, and they don't even have to be bad things. They can even be good things. But he's saying, hey, Christians, if you've been raised with Christ, hey, Christians, set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. So our hearts and our minds need to be focused on Jesus. That's how we do it. And, and it, 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 there's so many ways, I mean, just pressing into him, um, and like I've talked about with, uh, with relationships with people between spouses or dating or whatever, it's like, man, there's, there has to be an intentionality and pursuit of that relationship. When we begin to um, neglect that, what will happen is the same thing has happened to the church in Ephesus. We'll be, we'll be busy doing a lot of stuff but perhaps Jesus will need to remind us, but you've forgotten your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. That's God's call to us as we move forward, how to recognize spiritual growth, whether it's happening in us. If you'll just bow your heads with me. Father, I just, um, for my own sake, I ask your forgiveness. I do indeed repent for putting other things before you.
Father, we take us back, each one of us, take us back to that moment when we were just absolutely passionate about you. Take us back to that moment where, where we are passionately pursuing you with intentionality. Show us how to do that. Show us how to set our hearts on things above. Show us how to set our minds on things above. Eliminate the distractions in our life, Father. We, we, need, we need hobbies and we need all those things. We need activities. But, Father, you, you need to be our focus. You need to be what we are passionately pursuing. I thank you that you're patient with us, Lord. Draw us unto yourself. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Pastor Jeff Hatcher with Wiley United Methodist Church in Abilene, Texas. I want to thank you for listening to this message from God's Word today. Uh, I want to remind you that you have a Savior. His name is Jesus, and He loves you. I also would like to, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to, to pray this simple prayer with me. Father, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I confess it. I repent of my sin, and I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to wash me as white as snow. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you prayed that prayer maybe for the first time today, I want to invite you to do four things. First of all, to share that decision you've made with a member of the clergy. Don't try to walk this journey alone. And then secondly, I invite you to be baptized. Jesus himself commanded us that we should celebrate our faith through baptism. And then I invite you to get into God's word. A book of John is a great place to start. And not because uh, somehow reading the Bible makes us a good person, but because there's life in God's Word. It's His inspired, holy Word. And then finally, I invite you to find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church to be a part of. If, if you have any questions at all, I just want you to know that I'm available. You can contact me at my email, jhatcher at wileymethodist.org. God bless you.